J.T. Crowley is talking books. On this show, you'll hear from emerging talent and seasoned veterans from around the world. Hello, I'm J.T. Crowley, and I would like to welcome on my show today, Heather Hancock, who is from the Canadian province of Saskatchewan. She's joining me to talk about her debut Christian contemporary book, Sister Lost. Heather's life has had its difficulties and challenges, and it would be probably fair to say more so than most people. She has lived with cerebral palsy since birth. Her disability, unfortunately, attracted all sorts of abuse, mainly fueled from ignorance and fearful misconceptions surrounding the symptoms and characteristics associated with cerebral palsy. When the levels of abuse became too much for her to handle, which at times in her teenage years um, gave her almost like some suicidal thoughts. And it was at those stages that she gave her life to Jesus within whom she found fortitude and comfort to get her through the most challenging times then and probably now. Despite the negative issues and setbacks, Heather has learned to adapt her life, which has resulted in her achieving most of her ambitions. Heather presently lives with her husband and cat Willow in a rural area, as I've already said, in the Saskatchewan province of Canada. And it can get very cold in winter, everybody. I think that, I think, um, Heather once said to me the other day, she had minus 60. We had minus 10 here in the UK. I can't imagine what minus 60 is like. Not going to go there. <laughs> well, I think I've said enough here. So I'm going to welcome Heather onto the show so that she can tell you more about herself. Heather, please come and join me on the show. Thank you. John, I'm so happy to be here and so privileged. Um, yes, I live in Saskatchewan. It's the middle province in Canada. It does get very cold. It is a prairie province, so mostly agricultural. Um, as to a little bit more about me, I have had to adapt my life a lot. Uh, I was a student nurse for a year and a half before I had to pack it in because my knees wouldn't hold me up anymore. Uh, so I went back to school, took some office administration courses, and worked as a unit clerk for 22 years. So still stayed in healthcare, just in the back administra administrative end of things, um, till 44, when the disability uh, effects of the disability kicked in, and I was forced to medically retire. And that's when I started to write. And here we are. <laughs> So why have you written this wonderful, wonderful book of your sister lost? And why now at this time of your life? Claire Langstrom, who's my main character, appeared on my screen during a writing sprint back in 2019. Um, I thought she was, I, I wrote a backstory on the history of her and her mother, which I'm sure we'll get into. And I thought I was done with her, but I wasn't. She wouldn't let me alone. So I started to outline this book. And when I write, I always write very prayerfully um, and let God guide the plot line as well. I like to say I co-write with God. Um, and so he made it very clear that I had the opportunity to bring in uh, the history of the treatment of people and persons with disabilities in Canada that spanned from the 1800s through to um, the early 2000s. This book is set in 2017, so we don't go too far back. Um, but it was important to me because it aff personally affected me as well when I was a child. So um, it was an opportunity to bring light to that and to do a little educating as well as adding depth and um, conflict into the story. You know, when I read your book, Heather, I was wondering why, that's why I've asked the question, 
why now i was um beginning to wonder why she's written it now as opposed to years ago now i know everybody there you go now heather there are 49 exhilarating tense twisting chapters to this book each chapter isn't particularly lengthy everybody now we're not going to forage around all the chapters everybody because we'll be here forever and a day and that's not the idea of this interview the idea is to give you a tantalizing glimpse to the storyline that lurks between the pages of this incredible and i i really mean everybody incredible uh book and if you want to know more about what's in the chapters and more about this book well very simply go and buy the book or go and have a look at um, Heather Hancock's social media sites, which I have listed on the written introduction, which is on Web Talk Radio, um, Talking Book Show, which is the link to the written link to this um, video interview. So, Heather, let's open the book and head straight to chapter one, everyone. Woohoo! Here you introduce us to Claire, the main character, who's coming up to 40 and quite content to be single. She's possibly seen by some of her closest friends as a loner. That's her choice. She's a nurse at a busy Toronto plastic surgery unit, has her own apartment nearby. Her favourite room at home is the room she's had converted into a library a place where she can escape the pressures of the world. Heather, why have you given Claire, the main character, these characteristics and this setting? Plus, what do you want the readers to ascertain from this opening chapter? It was important to me to um, expose both sides of Claire's personality. Professionally, she's a very competent, very confident nurse on the ward and in interacting with her colleagues and her clients or her patients. Um, in private, though, she's really an introvert and she's really got some insecurities that stem from abuse in her childhood. So I wanted the reader to be introduced to both sides of Claire and then by the end of that chapter um, there's a glimpse into um, some of what she went through as a child just this tiny glimpse um, it just sort of sets the stage for the events that are about to unfold now in the next chapter uh, Heather chapter two you're starting a uh, as far as I can see and understand, you're starting to open the cracks into Claire's life. What she does as a nurse and how bumping into twins on one of the hospital corridors triggers a flashback moment. The book in her library that doesn't have a title on in its spine is her personal journal. Now, she's a person not even her closest friends really know who she is. You reveal she has a twin and that her mother, Sybil, suffered from narcissistic personality disorder. Narcissistic, everyone. A sociopath who blamed Claire for the loss of the firstborn twin, Chelsea. Plus, you hint at the difficult and testing relationship that coexisted between Claire and her mother. Now, I sense that the opening storylines here are going to reveal some spectacular, sensitive revelations. And I'm beginning to feel, get a biting feel as to what this book is about. For me, Heather, this book is a Pandora's box of fascinating issues and subject matters. So can you, Tell us what this chapter is about and where you're going to take the readers from this chapter onwards. It's a Pandora's box, everyone. Certainly is. Um, 
I call it a roller coaster ride. But <laughs> oh, it sure is, everyone. Mm. That that's what happens after the box is open. Um, <clears throat> the reason why I put that scene in was to um, not only have the reader experience the shock of it. Um, of Claire bumping into these girls, but also um, for the reader to realize how um, fragile her her confident facade is at work and how easily she can be rattled in a certain situation and that it ties back to the death of her sister um, and the unresolved grief that she still carries to this day because her mother has so viciously blamed her for her older sibling's death. Um, Claire was the second born twin. Um, so, and she weighed two pounds more than Chelsea did. So her mom told her that she took everything from Chelsea and she should have been the one who died. That's basically um, the kind of viciousness that's been hurled at her her whole life. So when she bumps into these twin girls, it really throws her for a loop. But it's just a foreshadowing of what's about to happen in her life. Um, and I wanted that in there just to grab the reader's attention and to hold it there so that the events that are upcoming won't be as much of a shock and surprise. Oh, there are huge surprises coming, everybody. <laughs> Just wait. Now, Heather, when we were chatting prior to recording this interview, uh, we discussed the areas of the book that um, gave a fair and balanced view, you know, um, so that the, the audience or the readers could get a, a reasonable insight as to what your book is about. Now, you wanted to go to chapter five when you're part of chapter five. And yeah. you open up the chapter, I quote, must Fillmore finally relaxed once her son left for the office. His presence and demanding mm -hmm. nature were counterproductive to her patient's recovery. Claire documented this on the patient's chart with a special flag that ensured her son's time would be limited to strict visiting hours. That's not all part of what's in chapter five, everybody. Um, so firstly, Heather, I want you to, to tell everybody what's the narrative here, you know, and secondly, what's the significance of this section of the book to the opening plot? In particular, wait for it, everybody, the letter Claire's grandmother wrote to her. It's a beautiful powerful letter. Now, don't give everything away about the letter, but just skim over it. The opening of this chapter um, is to illustrate Claire's ability to set a boundary with a very abrasive son who um, has traits similar to her mom. And um, she's able to put those boundaries in place uh, for the health of her client. Then she goes home and brings in the mail and later in the evening discovers an envelope that's very official looking, um, which notifies her that her maternal grandmother has passed away and that she is required to attend uh, the reading of her grandmother's will. That the reading of her grandmother's will ends up being the catalyst that launches uh, it opens the Pandora's box wide open. It sure does, everybody. Uh, and we're also introduced to the character of Austin McIsaac, who is her lawyer. Um, and yes, there is a letter that he has held. His father held it first. He's held it now. And it's time for Claire to read it. Um, as she opens it, a picture falls out. It's very old Polaroid. I don't know if you remember Polaroid cameras. Oh, I do. Um, a very old Polaroid uh, photo with yellowed edges. And Claire um, is looking at it and realizes she recognizes those eyes. Those are her eyes. 
but she's only ever her mom only ever had one picture of her as a baby so she's thinking to herself why did her grandmother have a different picture she'd never seen before and that is what starts the crack to the pandora's box open um her grandmother then um has written her a letter when she's six months old um detailing certain events, revealing certain secrets and lies that she's unaware of until that moment. And in an instant, her world is flipped right upside down. Um, and thus the roller coaster ride begins. And I'll just leave it there. You can understand, Claire, you know, if that was you or that was me reading that letter, you'd be... Um, blown apart you really would but if you want to know what's in the letter everybody read the book <laughs> <laughs> now i'm puzzled and yet at the same time intrigued as to the birth certificates that are revealed in chapter nine the names on both claire's and chelsea's certificates this is a twist which I think you've thrown in to muddy the waters. Care to give us an insight as to why you've done this? Very briefly, because I don't want you to give the plot away here. I put these in because it's essential to the beginning of the fact finding that they need to undergo um in the to honor the the bequest in her grandmother's will uh austin's the one who finds these birth certificates because he has the ability to do so and i did um i did change certain aspects of the birth father um because there was more going on than even Claire was aware of. And so this wasn't just all about what happened to Chelsea. It was also about what happened to Claire. And it starts her to question a lot of her past and question her own relationship with her dad. And I'll leave it there. It's a very complex situation, everyone. It's fabulously written. Believe you me. Now... In the section of the book, I'm going to move on down the book here, everybody. Um, we're going to head to chapters 19 and 20. You talk about Claire having some home improvements done to her apartment <clears throat> without authorization, everybody. Uh oh, that could spell trouble. <laughs> A conversation with another character, Olivia. And you also touch upon the upcoming court appearance. Austin, you've already mentioned, uh, a lawyer friend, I believe, has been working on presenting or presenting a case to obtain access to Chelsea's whereabouts. Now, for many years, Claire believed her sister died at birth. A lie, her mother Sybil told her. Heather, what do you want the readers to glean from the plot in this section of the book? These two chapters, chapters 19 and 20. They are fabulous, fabulous. I have to say, I've, I've loved this book so much. 19 or 20 are, um, well, 20 is a transitional chapter. Um, 19 is a setup for that chapter, but there's also a specific reasons why uh, Claire's having those her spare bedroom, which is very outdated, she's having it um, completely renovated and made accessible. Um, and there's a reason for that that I will leave, leave for the readers to find out for themselves. But it also brings in the character of Olivia, who is her housekeeper. But Olivia has been her housekeeper and her nanny since she's been a very small child. Um, so they have a very close relationship. And that factors into this chapter and the banter between the two is is fun. Um, and I just wanted to bring that aspect into it 
um, because it becomes important a little bit farther down the line um, in certain ways. So that was why Olivia is there. And th then this court case, this court case is pivotal um, to being able to figure out what happened to Chelsea. And if she is or isn't still alive, we don't know. Um, <clears throat> and where she is, we don't know. So yeah. they're petitioning the court for access to documents from uh, an institution. For those that don't know the history of the disabled in Canada, people with physical and mental disabilities were put into institutions outside of the public eye. Um, for their entire lives, incarcerated away and treated very badly. Um, they're much like prisons in many ways. And so they were trying to get access to her, the, her documents from the institution. Um, and they know going into the court scene that it's 50-50 or 60-40 uh, chance that this will get released because of uh, something else they've received earlier than this, and I'm not going to give it away. But um, that's sort of why these chapters are written. Yeah, and um, there's more of this in Chapter 22, because in Chapter 22, Heather, which you almost touched upon, um, you want to draw attention to the courtroom scene. And here we have Claire and Austin, her lawyer friend, in court with Judge Carson, Judge Carson, playing out the scene here. And I think the outcome here is you keeping the reader in suspense. And you've already said that. So without spoiling the overall same plan, did you find writing this chapter, you know, chapter 22 of the court scene difficult? I did. I found it quite difficult to write, um, and not just because you have to get the legal order of courtroom happenings correct. <laughs> um, it was difficult because of the stress and strain emotionally on Claire um, and on Austin, who's trying to help her and be there for her and be her lawyer at the same time. Um, and both know that should the judge deny their request it it essentially closes the door and they don't know where else to go it would be a horrible thing uh, it would be a huge obstacle to overcome it is and everyone. so um yeah that's it's why it was a tense tense chapter but it's also a pivotal chapter because it changes the direction of the book again it does everybody it's very tense it's a very um, tight chapter and as Heather just said it changes the course of the book this is Heather taking us down a different route here she's twisting this story again everybody as a good yeah, the roller today. coaster twists oh she has this Pandora's box has got many many secrets to it now Heather I want to move on down to chapter 30. Um, this is the follow through uh, from a TV appearance. Yes. And there are two messages. Now, this is an interesting turn of events here. Where are you taking the reader here? This is a chapter of hope, basically. Um, the opportunity to be on this TV show for Claire um, is terrifying. And it's also necessary. And I won't give any more away than that. The two messages that come from a tip line um, end up twisting the story yet again in a completely uh, unforeseen direction. Uh, and I won't say, too, I don't want to give away anything, but it's it's another pivotal chapter with the ending of, of that, that one. It's a very so, pivotal um, chapter. It's a very pivotal chapter, mm -hmm. everybody. 
and it's about the timing of the messages. That's what I'm saying. If you want to know yeah, why, the timing is read it. very important. It's the timing is really important. That's the yeah. big twist here. It is. Now, I can see why, Heather, the storyline you talk about here in Chapter 39 is important to the book. Uh, well, not only the book, but to you yourself. For it's simply about discrimination and how society perceives and reacts to a person with a disability, particularly a person who relies on the use of a wheelchair. The scene here in this chapter, it takes place in a shop with Claire, Chelsea and Felicity. Now, Felicity is Chelsea's adopted mother, everybody. They are buying dresses. Heather, could you talk to us about the discrimination that's going on in this chapter? I realized in writing this chapter, I had the ability to educate a little bit again, so I did. Um, what's going on in this chapter is um, they need formal wear for a very specific event. And um, they've they've separated to um, look for their dresses. And without giving the whole thing away, Claire is immediately approached by a staff member for who offers assistance. Um, and Claire's watching across the store to see what's happening there, and she realizes that nobody's approaching them. So she directs the salesperson who wants to assist her to go and assist um, Felicity and Chelsea. Who get and that it doesn't go well. Let's put it that way. It just doesn't, it doesn't go, go well. well, everybody. So. Um, she be <laughs> no, she becomes very angry, and um, her sister has to um, restrain her a little. So, mm. leave it there. We'll leave it there. We'll leave it. There. Now, the last chapter we're going to go to everybody is chapter forty-two. Um, now, Heather, this is the bedside scene at the last moment of Sybil's life in Vancouver. For me, this was a bittersweet situation, a scene which you could have written with such vitriolic anger. Yet you managed to get the hurtful message across in such a sensitive and delicate manner. Why did you choose to adopt this softer but poignant approach? But before you answer, I think you need to set the scene for the audience. So what's going on here, very, very briefly, and why did you adopt this soft approach as to being, because you could have been given the character Claire a very, very angry approach here. Quite rightly so. What's happening in this chapter, it's not... Yeah. What's happening in this chapter is, uh, it's another pivotal chapter. Um, Sybil takes a turn for the worse. Um, Claire is notified and um, her mother has expressed her wishes that she doesn't want Claire there at all and Claire decides to hack with what she wants she's going to be there um, so the scene unfolds from there um, with Chelsea's adoptive parents giving her a ride to the hospital um, there. This is a chapter that's about um, forgiveness. It's about uh, reconciliation, and in some ways, it's about restoration. And so that's why I took the softer approach. Claire's had years to process her anger, and while there are times where she does get very, very angry in the book, um she realizes that this is a very pivotal moment for all three of them. So she takes her leading and guidance from the Lord on how to approach this. It's a wonderful chapter. It really is, everybody. Very, very sensitive, but powerful. Um, and when you read the book, you probably think the same as me. Wow. 
she should have been so angry in this chapter, but yet she's not. But there you go. Now, Heather, I have thoroughly enjoyed reading this book. It's gripped me. It's taken me a long time to put the questions and formulate how am I going to do this, you know, to give the people the best flavour, you know, perception of this book. It is absolutely stunning, everybody. Um, and all I can say is, go and have a look who Heather Hancock is. But I want to know, um, Heather, are there any more books like this coming down the line? You know, now you've got this debut book out. What's coming? Please, more, 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 please. There is another book coming. It is not in Claire's world. It is. It introduces a new character and her family. Um, I, it's called Deep Roots, The Coleman Legacy, and it's... The first draft of it is complete, and I will work on um, revising and editing and getting that published this year, as well as I hope to get a book of poetry out as well. I am a multi-genre author. She's a multi-genre author, everybody. She sure is. <laughs> um, Heather, who would you like to read your book? You know, um, ladies, gentlemen, um people with a disability or or wider wider market young old when i first started writing it my ideal reader was uh women in their say 40s and upward um and and also disabled people because it's always affirming to us to see ourselves in fiction, it doesn't happen very often. Um, you've, I'm sure, heard, seen the interviews with actors. The same thing happens on screen for them. So in fiction, it's the same. We don't often see ourselves represented in fiction accurately. Um, so it was important that I do that. And so, yes, to all of that, and along the way with beta readers and and some of the reviews that have come in so far, I realized that the ideal reader for this book is really quite far reaching. It crosses genders, it crosses age groups. Um, there's something in this book that resonates with people and it, it gets them to thinking long after the book is over, um, which I'm very thankful for because it does touch on some very deep subjects. And I did want the readers to think and to learn. So if Chelsea and Claire's story can do that, um, then my job's done and I'm very happy. So to answer the question, it's all of the above. Really. <laughs> uh, I thought you were going to There's something that. in this book for everybody. Oh, there is. There yeah. is everybody in this book. Where can people get your book from? It is on Amazon in paperback and in ebook. That's the only place to get the paperback right now, though, if that's what you like. Um, it's also available on ebook on Apple Books, um, Barnes and Noble's Nook, I think it is, and Kobo, and a few others, Smashwords, and other places. Um, so yes, those links are available. Um, and I have a website as well that people can have a look at because I have a few other things on there as well. Some short stories, a few poems, that kind of thing. Heather Hancock, it has been an absolute joy, an absolute pleasure reviewing your book. Um, and I know I, I say this very often, everybody, but this book was a real eye-opener for me. It's beautifully written it's very sensitive it's powerful it packs a serious punch it's a real pandora's box of twists turns punches sensitivity all wrapped up in one title called sister lost i'm jt crowley thanks for listening watching wherever you're in the world until next time stay safe <laughs>